I'm so vulnerable right now. A cesarean is a fucking walk in the park compared to my previous surgeries. Oh my God, there's this baby that a big old blood clot came out of my vagina. A viewer was there for the birth of my first child. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Hormone Diaries. First off, thank you so, so much for all of your kind words and your love and your support on the birth video, which if you haven't seen, it's available to watch for your entertainment. But this video is going to be all about my postpartum experience, what they call the fourth trimester. Although my understanding pre having a baby of the fourth trimester was that it was like about just the birthing parents body and emotions and everything going on there. And that's what this video is going to be about. But what I didn't realize is that the baby is also going through the fourth trimester with you. Like they very much still just want to be inside you. <laughs> They're not ready to be born. No. But that's a whole, whole other thing. In this video, I'm going to be talking through my experience in hospital, post C-section, post birth, on the postnatal ward, then at home recovery, also going to be chatting through what happened with my ileostomy, my stoma. There were a lot of questions in the comments of the birth video about how my stoma kind of worked <laughs> during birth. And there's honestly really not a lot to report there in the labor and birth process, but postpartum, I have some updates. <laughs> so the fourth trimester, this postpartum period is the first 12 weeks, three-ish months post birth. As I'm recording this, I'm like three and a half months post birth. Rowan is about three and a half months old. And so we're just gonna dive into everything starting from a day by day account of my time in hospital because yes, I continued taking notes after the labor and birth. It kept me sane, I swear. <laughs> in hospital, Saturday the 30th of April, 2022, we left off the birth video with that clip of me in the hospital bed with my anesthetic wearing off, being very confused about the fact that I'd just had a baby and really wanting to see him because he had to go to the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit because he was having some breathing issues after birth. That is where we left off and that is where the story continues. So when that clip was filmed, I was in a private room and I really, really wanted wanted to see Rowan, obviously. <laughs> like I just had this baby and I hadn't really seen him yet. And I remember one of the midwives saying to me that she wouldn't let me go see him until I was mobile, until I was able to like move. And I was like, okay, just you watch me. And I was like twiddling my toes and like moving my legs and moving my bum and trying to get as mobile as possible so that I could be able to do like a transfer to a wheelchair and then be taken to see him. She really didn't think that I was going to be able to do it. And then there was another member of staff who came in and I was like, I can move. Like, I swear I can, I can do it. Like, take me to see my baby. And actually what ended up happening is I was moved from that private room to the general postnatal ward. And so I was like, well, you're going to be moving me anyway so we might as well go via my baby and that was at around midnight so that was kind of like six ish hours after Rowan was born too long too long so that night Rowan stayed on NICU and I was on that postnatal ward and I do not remember it like this was probably my last opportunity to get a full night's sleep but I don't think I did because any time a member of staff came around to like do obs or whatever I was like can I go see my baby? Can I go see my baby? Obviously just like completely high on adrenaline and post birth hormones and everything. I do not really remember much of what happened that night, but that brings us to Sunday, the 1st of May. And I go and visit Rowan on NICU at about 9 a.m. And they're like, do you want to breastfeed him? And I was like, uh, yes, please. <laughs> because until that point he'd been having a feeding tube, I'd tried to do some expressing and I'm going to do a whole hormone diary episode about the breastfeeding journey but all I'll say now is that I was very excited because I wasn't expecting to be able to breastfeed him then and they were just like yeah here you go <laughs> go for it and I was like ah 
So that was very exciting. And some of the baby doctors and staff there like helped me out with that and stuff. Dan also wasn't allowed to stay the night, but Dan arrived that day. And parents of babies on NICU can be there 24 seven. However, <laughs> partners of people who've just given birth at the hospital that I was at were only allowed in for four hours a day and each bed had its own time slot and this was all related to COVID restrictions but honestly I thought it was ridiculous and maybe I'll get into that a bit later but Dan's time slot to visit me was 9am till 1pm but whilst Rowan was still on NICU we both could be there 24-7. So that day was quite funny because obviously I wanted to be in NICU and be with Rowan as much as possible and the baby doctors were really encouraging me to breastfeed because that was something that I wanted to do. However, I had medications that I was being administered on the postnatal ward. So I would be in NICU and there'd be midwives from the postnatal ward ringing up being like, is Hannah there? Like we need to give her her meds. Like, can you send her back down? And then I would be on the postnatal ward and the baby doctors would be ringing being like, Rowan's hungry, can you send the mum up to come and feed him and so I would just be like back and forth and this is the day after I've had a c-section I think that first day because I really couldn't walk very well I had to always like get someone as well to go and wheel me very quickly afterwards because I was like trying to be as mobile as possible I then did the walk myself but very slowly so that day Rowan was doing really well and so he was discharged from NICU and that is when I had my first night with Rowan wow, now I really wish that I'd gotten some sleep the night before. The only thing that I wrote in my notes about that night, but I do have like a pretty strong memory of this, is that it took me about four hours to feed him and settle him to like go down for the night. Although like do newborns even go down for the night? That's not really a thing. I just remember being so exhausted and so stressed because breastfeeding was really difficult. He was struggling to latch and he just wouldn't settle. I just couldn't get any rest. In the end, one of the midwives was just like, why don't we just give him a bottle of formula and see if it goes down? And I was like, honestly, anything, <laughs> like I don't care. And he had some formula and it knocked him out. And I was very grateful. That was a really, really rough night. And I was just completely, completely exhausted. The next day, the next morning on Monday, the 2nd of May, Dan came and I just basically slept. <laughs> the entire time Dan was there because he was watching Rowan. So even though Rowan had been discharged from NICU, we were waiting on some test results for him. They all came back fine and the baby doctor came, <laughs> I don't know why I keep saying baby doctor, the pediatrician. <laughs> I think because everything's quite babyish on those wards because everyone's like, oh, mummy, and like, oh, baby. And it's like, oh, it's the baby doctors. So maybe that's why. <laughs> but the pediatrician came by to say that everything was fine. But whilst she was there, Rowan then just kind of had this like spitting up coughing thing and she seemed quite worried by it and so we got whisked back off to NICU to do some more tests to see if he was okay. And that again was very stressful. Dan had gone by this point because it was after his visiting hours, but because we were back on NICU, I was like, you can be here, like come right now, please. Because obviously I didn't want to be there by myself because it was just like, oh, there might be something wrong with your baby. I don't want to go into too much detail about Rowan's medical stuff because that's private to him. But the general pattern was just doctors being overly cautious, which they absolutely should be when it comes to babies as well. And most of the time, the doctors just really weren't worried about him. They were just like, we're just playing it safe. Don't think there's anything wrong here, but we're just gonna like run some more tests. And the pattern was tests would come back absolutely fine. They're like, okay, Rowan's great. And then a new thing would come up and then they'd be like, okay, now we've resolved that thing, that thing's fine. And then there'll be another thing. And that's why I ended up staying in hospital for four days. Cause we were just like waiting for the doctors to be like, okay, we are now very sure that Rowan is okay. And you can go home with him. <laughs> it just took a while. But Rowan was only on NICU then for a few hours whilst they did those tests and he came back to the postnatal ward with me. And in my notes this time, I wrote that it was a better night and it only took two hours to successfully feed and settle him. What fun. So Tuesday the 3rd of May, this is the day that I thought was going to be discharge day. But like I said, with Rowan's medical stuff and things coming back fine and then something new happening, that is again what happened on this day and I broke. Like I was so ready to be home. It was so 
so difficult only having Dan be able to be on the ward with me for four hours out of a 24 hour day post c-section with a newborn baby like honestly i do not know how the parents of people who gave birth like really really in the full midst of the pandemic when you weren't allowed birthing partners like in the postnatal ward at all like i have no idea how you did it i think it's completely inhumane honestly apparently also from my notes it was a very stressful feeding day and this was the day that a big old blood clot came out of my vagina so post birth, you're just bleeding. You've got like one big heavy period that's been stuck inside you for nine months that needs to come out. And I remember being on the toilet and then like seeing this massive blood clot. And I don't normally get blood clots like with my period. So that was just like a whole new thing to me. And I was like ringing the bell and the midwives like coming in, I'm like, uh, this and they seemed to think that it was all fine they were like oh, okay yeah no that's all right like it wasn't <laughs> as big a one and maybe they see but it was like this is big to me but they were like thank you for ringing the bell you did the right thing awesome yes thank you <laughs> i've also written here that i was just bored out of my mind i was really tired but my brain could only really focus on the entertainment of messaging friends and family and also doing wordle i just couldn't really do much else my brain <laughs> was not there. This day was definitely the hardest in hospital and it was because we got the news that I wasn't gonna be discharged that day when we thought that we were. And also I'd like run out of wipes and nappies for Rowan and I had a full on breakdown and cried and there was this like wonderful member of staff who came in and comforted me and I had to get Dan to come back and visit to drop off things for Rowan and me. But he wasn't gonna be allowed on the ward. Like I would have to like, meet him outside or he'd have to give the stuff to a member of staff to then give to me like I wasn't allowed to see him like he wasn't allowed to come in it was absolutely ridiculous but the really lovely woman basically was like if you want to go out and see your husband then I'll stay here and watch the baby and like some people maybe wouldn't want to be away from their baby like in that moment but that was all I wanted and so she watched Rowan and I like went out and saw Dan and picked up the stuff from him and we both had a big old cuddle and cry oh, that was a horror day. So the next day, Wednesday the 4th of May. This day there was lots of bonding <laughs> with the other people on my ward. I broke down the night before, the woman next to me broke down that day and then we were all just like having conversations about how hard it is not having our partners there. But this was also the day that we were discharged and they told us in the morning that would be what was happening and Dan arrived at 9am like ready to go, car seat, like we are getting out of here. However, there was a lot of paperwork and we did not get out of there until 5 p.m. What fun. Luckily, they let Dan stay with me that entire time and not kick him out at 1 p.m. because then he would just have to come back anyway. So very grateful for that. But oh my goodness, we finally, finally got out. I say that like it was some kind of prison. It wasn't. There was ups and downs. <laughs> So I wanted to talk just a bit more about how I felt about that postnatal ward because as you would have seen from my labor and birth video, I had a great time. Like I have a really positive association with a four day labor and an unplanned C-section and my time in hospital and engaging with, you know, all the hospital staff there. Like that really positive experience for me. Postnatal ward and experience, very different very different vibe. I love the NHS. I just want to put that out there. The NHS is absolutely incredible. We are so lucky to have the NHS. The only reason why I personally have had bad experiences with the NHS is because of Tory cuts in funding. And I just want to make that really clear and that it's not the NHS's fault. It is Tory governments trying to ruin our beloved NHS. And I just need to say that before I now go on and complain about my experience. <laughs> the whole thing was honestly a bit of an emotional blur. It was made really difficult because Dan could only be there four hours a day. And obviously they're so short staffed and you'd think that if every baby had an extra person there and parent who just gave birth as well, if every patient and every baby had an extra person there to look after them and just like do some of the basic things that they need help with, then that would relieve some stress and relieve some of the workload from the NHS staff who are there. That's just an observation. <laughs> also, when it came to the staff, it was really hit and miss. Like there were some 
absolute gems, some amazing, amazing people, especially like the woman who looked after Rowan and comforted me, you know, when I went to see Dan and stuff. But then there were some others that were just like really quite harsh. And you're just like, I'm so vulnerable right now. Like probably the most vulnerable I've ever been, like emotionally, bodily, like all of the things. And you just kind of like feel like you're being told you're doing things wrong and not fun, not fun. Also, whenever I was having issues with feeding Rowan and I would ask for help, it was always a different person who came in who had like different advice, different techniques, and often sometimes contradictory. And it was just very confusing and overwhelming. And even though the over caution with Rowan is what <laughs> led to my meltdown because we had to stay in an extra day, I am so grateful for that. And I know that that was really important. And I also just wanted to shout out the Rowan's pediatrician, the doctor that was on NICU. And also this is the doctor that was in the theater when I was having my C-section, she was a viewer of mine. So hello, you know who you are. Thank you so much for looking after me and my baby when we were in hospital. Absolutely wild. That is like a viewer was there for the birth of my first child. Kind of weird, but cool. <laughs> Okay, so that's all the hospital stuff. And before we get on to like what was happening at home, let's chat about my stoma. So the stoma itself, absolutely fine, like I said, during birth. Then post-birth, as my belly started to kind of like deflate and there just wasn't that like same pressure against my belly, like my belly wasn't hard anymore. I had a big old stoma leakage. What fun. The tricky thing here was though, that midwives are not trained in stomas. And so I had this leakage. I'm post-surgery. I really can't do much. And so I like have to get someone over to help me, but they have no idea what they're doing. And so I'm having to instruct them on what to do to help me. It was undignified, I will say. And I know a lot of medical professionals like sometimes watch my videos. And so maybe if you are a midwife in training, then, you know, ask about stomas. Although I will say that statistically, you're not gonna find many women of reproductive age with stomas. There's not many of us, but you know, we do exist. <laughs> and it would be helpful to have someone just like swoop in and be like, okay, don't worry, I got you and sort me out whilst there's poo everywhere. I also almost had another leak, like just the bags and my stoma. It was all a bit wild. I think like post-surgery, my whole belly, my abdomen was quite like inflamed because my stoma got bigger, even though my belly got smaller. Like it just was like, what has happened? Luckily, my stoma nurse works in the other general part of the hospital. And so she managed to find some time to come over to the postnatal ward and visit me and take a look at my stoma and re measure it and give me some more products and bags that I might need. So very grateful for that. So one of the new things that my stoma nurse gave me is this moldable ring. And so the idea is that you put this around the hole in the thing so you can stretch this. I'm not gonna take it out now because I need these. And it creates like an extra protective layer. I don't know. I tried these and it didn't work in terms of like helping with the leakages. And then she said that I could probably go back to my old convex bags, which is very exciting. So pretty soon after birth, I was like using the same bags that I was using pre-pregnancy, but just the ones that had the bigger hole. And I love those bags. So I was very happy to go back to using them. I just like the way they look. I like the drain mechanism. Love it. I then wasn't getting any leaks. My stoma was getting smaller. Every Every time I did a bag change, I was having to remeasure it, cut a smaller hole. And I was honestly really surprised at how quick that process was. I was going into pregnancy being like, this may be a farewell to the stoma that I know and love. And who knows what kind of stoma I'm gonna end up with at the end. Definitely different, I think, but it is nowhere near as big as it was during peak pregnancy. Now though, I'm still having some issues. Like I'm still getting a lot of output on the base plate, like on the back of the base plate, which isn't causing any leakages, but when I change my stone bag and I take it off, I can see all of the output there. And that's obviously getting onto my skin, which is not good for your skin. You don't want poo on your skin. And I went to see the stoma nurse about it and she like gave me some tips and tricks and stuff, but that's still not working. So I don't really know. This is the current situation. When I did go and see my stoma nurse though, I was with Rowan and he was kicking off. He did not want to be in his pram. And so I had to hold him. I was like holding him and comforting him 
on one side whilst the stoma nurse was <laughs> doing my stoma pack stuff on the other side. It was a sight to behold. I don't know if this ring is really helping any more. I'm gonna try and figure it out, but I'm definitely getting some like red irritated skin around my stoma as well. So we'll see. This is a to be continued story. But all in all, the main thing is that it reduced back down to almost its previous size. Who knew? So obviously I had a C-section and so I wanted to talk about my cesarean recovery. This is something that I feel like I might have to be careful about saying because a lot of people have C-sections and it might be the only surgery that they ever have in their life and a lot of people find it really difficult. Also, there might be some complications that you get with it and I'll just first off say that I haven't had any complications with my cesarean or my scar or the healing or anything, but a cesarean is a fucking walk in the park <laughs> compared to my previous surgeries. And I know that that may sound insensitive to some folks who found their cesarean recovery really difficult. That is obviously absolutely valid. My experience is that it was really easy in comparison to previous open abdominal surgeries that I've had. And that makes sense to me. Like those surgeries, I had to be under general anesthetic. They like cutting you fully open. They lasted hours and a cesarean I was awake for and lasted like max an hour with opening up, getting the baby out and sewing back up. So they are very different surgeries. And I think also having had the experience of recovering from major surgery twice, I think mentally I was very prepared for that process and mentally I was really prepared for it to be hard because I knew how hard it could be. And then when it was easier than I expected, that made me feel really good. I was like, oh my God, this is kind of easy. <laughs> Except it wasn't easy, it just was easier. Don't mind me whilst I just retie my hair. Do, do, do. So as I mentioned in my birth video, my C-section was done by the consultant because they wanted the most experienced person there doing it just in case there were any issues with scar tissue from my previous surgeries. And it was quite funny because one of the things that she said as she was sewing me up and I think she was saying it to me or she was saying it to herself, but loud enough for me to overhear. She was basically fully complimenting herself on her stitching me up job, which I love. She was like, this is great. This is going to be a really lovely scar. Like you, it's going to be very thin. And I just love the fact that she was just bigging up her own work, excellent. And she was right because every time that a midwife or whoever has had to look at my scar to check the healing, they're like, that's a nice scar. And I'm like, thank you very much. The consultant did it. Um, so very pleased with that and just thought it was funny. But yeah, the scar itself has healed really nicely and not had any issues with. And then the recovery itself, I think as well as having previous experience recovering from surgery, the things that really helped was just being as mobile as possible and getting out and about as quickly as possible, even if that was for just short walks every day. However, there was one day when instead of getting a bus back home, I was like, I'm feeling really good actually. I like, I think I can walk it. And it was like an hour long walk and I did it and I felt great. I was like, yeah, oh my God, my body is like feeling good. And then the next day I really paid for it. Like I was like, oh, okay, yep. I'm definitely still recovering from surgery. This hurts. But I've also written in my notes that I was feeling pretty good by four weeks. And they say to kind of not lift anything heavier than your baby, not drive. Generally, they give you the kind of C-section recovery timeline as six weeks. And so the fact that I was feeling pretty good by four, I was like, oh, okay, like this is gonna get easier. And right now, three and a half months out, I feel as good as I did before. Maybe not that good actually. <laughs> that's, that's maybe pushing it. But I don't feel like I've just had surgery is what I'll say. Okay, so I wanted to talk a bit more about some other weird postpartum and fourth trimester things once we got home. So because I'd had a C-section, I had to have blood thinning injections and we had to continue those at home. I really wasn't looking forward to these. I had a bunch of these when I was in hospital for my previous illnesses and surgeries and stuff. Dan had to administer them. I was not prepared to do it myself. And he was very excited at first. He was like, oh yeah, I get to stab you with a needle. And then I think we had to do like 
six days worth of it at home. And by the end, he was like, I don't like stabbing you with a needle. <laughs> but we were very glad for that to be done. That was not fun. They also discharged me with a whole bunch of painkillers and they tried to discharge me home with whatever the laxative thingy is, I guess, because one of the things after birth is you can get really constipated and people talk a lot about that first poo after birth. However, with a stoma, it's like not an issue for me at all. And so a lot of the <laughs> midwives would just be like, okay, have you been to the toilet? Have you done a poo? And I'm like, that question's not relevant for me. My stoma's working fine. And then they try and give me this massive bottle of laxative. I'm like, I don't need that. <laughs> that is one part of the postpartum recovery. I'm very glad that I didn't have to experience, I will say. So next I wanted to talk about the sleep deprivation. The other day I was actually taking Rowan to my studio because I had to go pick some things up and this woman stopped me in the lift and was like, oh, do you normally take your baby to work with you? And I was like, oh no, no, I'm just, I'm just visiting. And she said to me, I heard this sleep deprivation is really bad, but like how bad actually is it? And I was like, well, I've not slept for more than four hours straight in two months, I think it was at that point. And if I got four hours, like that was a good one. Normally it's about two hours at a time. And she was just like, oh my God. <laughs> And honestly, like the shock on her face, I was like, yeah, it's bad. However, in my notes, I have written sleep deprivation bad, but not as bad as expected and easy with Dan doing everything else around the flat. And as I was preparing for this video, I was like, ah, uh, I must have written this before it kicked in. Cause there was definitely like a good few days at home when we were just all so excited to be together and home as a family and just the adrenaline of like, oh my God, there's this baby. Then I remember at some point it hitting me and me being like, okay, yeah, I've not properly slept and I feel fucked right now. I'm still sleep deprived, not fun. Annoyingly, you just get used to it. And that's like a sad thought. I really hope that I get to sleep for more than four hours at a time sometime in the future. Rowan still wakes up a lot in the night and then even if he does a longer sleep, for some reason I still wake up and my stoma bag is full and so I still have to wake up even if he isn't. So not quite winning in the sleep department yet. <laughs> Moving on to the pelvic floor. So I was so good at doing my pelvic floor exercises during pregnancy. I used the NHS Squeezy app. I was doing my pelvic floor reps like two or three times a day. I was really on it. It was properly part of my routine. I just really, really badly forget. Like sometimes I remember, but maybe I'm doing one pelvic floor rep like a week. <laughs> Good times. One of the things I really wasn't expecting, especially because I had a C-section delivery, was for my pelvic floor to feel so weak. It didn't feel super weak during pregnancy, and I assumed because I didn't have a vaginal birth that it wouldn't be as bad, but oh boy, I just would suddenly need a wee, and then like a little bit of wee came out, and then at one point whilst I was in hospital, I'd like full on wet the bed because I just couldn't keep it in. I had no pelvic floor strength, like, it, it was impossible to try and keep it in, in time to get to the toilet, which was right next to my bed. I think one of the reasons why I'm bad at remembering to do my Kegels though, is because that hasn't happened since. And I haven't noticed or felt like I have a weak pelvic floor, i.e. I'm not pissing myself constantly. However, that is, you know, not the full picture and I should probably still do them. Next up, let's talk about the belly, the pregnant belly. And I want to caveat all of this with messaging around like bouncing back and getting your body back after birth. I hate it. It is completely unnecessary. It's just completely disgusting and gross expectations on people who have just given birth. Like that should not be where our priorities are at all. And it's just another thing that is this pressure on people who give birth to look a certain way and saying that, you know, like our value is just in how our bodies look rather than what our bodies have just fucking done. I just want that to be super clear because I know some people will look at me and think that I have 
bounced back and I've done nothing. Yes, I walked a lot after my C-section. That was primarily motivated by recovering from surgery and getting my strength back. I think I've just gotten lucky and I even hate that I think of it as gotten lucky. I've really just not done anything. My belly just deflated kind of just gradually over time. I fit into most of my clothes from before, but this is not something that I was expecting expecting to happen and I think it just does happen for some people and it doesn't happen for others and I really hope that we don't put pressure on ourselves to make that happen and yeah my body is still very different from what it was like before but I think just in general I'm shocked that it's done what it did. One of the things that I think might be why other than just like random coincidence is that pre getting pregnant I was the fittest that I've been since my surgeries. I was doing lots of tennis and I was cycling everywhere and I think maybe my body being like that before I got pregnant maybe set myself up for having this body now post birth. It feels very weird honestly like even talking about this because I know a lot of people have a lot of issues physically and mentally like after birth around the whole body changing thing and I'm very grateful that it's <sighs> This is why it's difficult to talk about because by saying that I got lucky and by saying that I'm grateful that my body has like almost gone back to the way it was before is implying that that is a good thing. I think the thing that I'm grateful for is that I don't have to think about it or that I'm not worried about it or thinking about it. It's not taking up real estate in my brain. Does that make sense? So obviously connected to a lot of the body stuff is mental health and this is a huge, huge topic of conversation, especially postpartum. This, I feel like I can say I'm very lucky. I've not really experienced any bad mental health turns post birth, definitely no postnatal depression. And even the baby blues, which I don't really know how to describe that. It's just something that I've heard people talk about. Obviously it has been incredibly emotional and overwhelming, but I don't know what it is, but I've never really experienced massive like emotional turns during my menstrual cycle. I never really experienced it during pregnancy either. I don't know, maybe it's something the way that my brain is <laughs> that I tend to be pretty level a lot of the time. I also have a great support network and so that has been really helpful and yes there has been like lots of crying with happiness and there's definitely been like a couple of times where I have just broken down and cried from sheer exhaustion but overall like I've been really great however even though I'm someone who has historically had pretty stable mental health I know that postnatal depression can just come out of nowhere it can affect anyone it can even affect non-birthing partners after birth as well my heart goes out to anyone who is experiencing that and I really hope that you're able to find support and the help that you need one of the things I thought was really brilliant when I saw my health visitor was that she had this like well-being form for me to fill out and a lot of it was about mental health and emotional well-being and also the state of your relationship too like there was a point where Dan was out of the room changing Rowan's nappy you know she's asking about if I feel safe at home and if I feel like loved at home by Dan you know what's going on in the relationship and I think that it's really great that there are those moments built into the system of intervention if people need it obviously there's always more that can be done with all of these different points that you are seeing healthcare professionals in making sure that there are the right interventions and there is that support there. But what I received, I thought was really good. But obviously I wasn't like in super need of it. And so I hope that for people who do need it, then there is that support there as well. So the final thing that I want to talk about is something that affected me and basically all of the other birthing parents in my NCT group. And we were all just shocked that this happened because no one told us. And the more I looked it up, the more there were just all of these stories from people where it's just like the thing that they don't tell you about the fourth trimester and like postpartum period and all of this. And I'm like, how is this? Yes, the thing that no one tells you, but then I'm finding all of this stuff about how it's the thing that no one tells you. So I'm telling you now, <laughs> and hopefully we can spread the word, the night sweats. 
oh boy, the night sweats. Apparently, according to my notes, for me, this started about 10 days after birth and it's the worst sweats I've ever experienced. Absolutely disgusting. I woke up soaked. Every orifice of my body was drenched. I had to sleep on a towel. Probably, other than like the sleep deprivation and the surgery recovery, probably one of the worst, hardest bits of my <laughs> postpartum experience. I hated these night sweats. They were awful. But the worst of it was gone at around four weeks. So grateful. Like imagine if I was having those night sweats during our heat wave. Like at least it hadn't gotten to that point in the weather yet at that time. <sighs> also, thank you past me for cutting my hair short. <sighs> Nasty. I just needed you all to know that so that you're prepared. Get yourself a towel, sleep on it. Thank you for watching. This video is probably incredibly long. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you liked hearing about my postpartum experience. Are you on this journey as well? Like, are you currently in the fourth trimester or are you pregnant and about to go through it all? Best of luck to you. There is so much of this experience that is completely out of our control. Things like your body, things like your mental health, like there's so much of it that no matter how much you do, stuff just happens and you just gotta roll with the punches, unfortunately. But obviously there is help and support out there if you need it. And I would highly recommend seeking help from professionals or just your friend and family support network if that is something that you need. For me, I absolutely needed that support from Dan and from friends and family to get through that time and continue to get through this time of having a baby. But thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye.